All right, great. Uh, thank you, Megan, for organizing this session and welcome everybody. So the, the presentation I'm going to do today is this idea of what has been traditionally taught in intro stack courses, right? That one sample, two sample inference, where we try to give students only the problems that we think they can understand. And visualization has traditionally taken a back seat, you know, where, but once you bring in visualization, you can really tackle very complex problems, right? With many variables. And those are the kinds of data students are going to see when they get out in the workforce. So it's kind of better, at least my philosophy is it's better to prepare them for that um, than to try to restrict the curriculum to just those one um, and two sample inference problems. So I'm gonna shut off my video just because as I look at different screens here. Um, now I'm gonna give you a little context first. So um, I have a bachelor's degree in printing sciences and graphic arts. So not mathematics or uh, statistics at all. And this is back in 1991. Uh, I was about two months from graduation and, and felt, wait, I'm not ready to leave college yet. And I remember walking through the hall in the science building, and all of you have seen this sort of bulletin board in the hallways where they have different schools, you know, promoting their different programs. And I looked up and, and there was this brochure for the for a graduate degree in statistics. And it had a visualization like this as the main heading. And the catalog that I got from the department was just filled with all of these visualizations, right? That made up most of it. And this was very enticing to me because I was looking at this and I was like, oh, that's awesome because I have this love for science. I have this love for graphic arts. And I was like, well, statistics, that must be just combining those two. And I thought, okay, I'll go get a master's degree in statistics. How hard could that be? Because um, at the time I thought this is what you learned. You're like, oh, you learned how to make cool visualizations and graphics. Now, what I didn't know is there was an enormous amount of mathematics to learn. And of course, I had to take calculus and linear algebra. So I, this weekend, I went into my garage and I started finding all my old notes and homework problems. And I've got some textbooks where I used to write into the margins. But something I noticed is I would often sort of draw out these visualizations of concepts I was trying to learn. There's some linear algebra stuff. And then here's the little treat. There's 22-year-old there's, um, me. Um, no, I'm teaching myself here conditional probability. So you can see a bunch of the, the board has got calculus on it, but over on the right, I'm drawing, trying to draw graphics to understand, right? So graphics and visualizations to me is a big part of, of learning. Now, unfortunately back in the nineties, you know, computing obviously is a big part of statistics, but at that time it was coding and SAS was the predominant language. There's a little bit of S plus and both to run the analyses as well as the output you would see would be all of this, uh, you know, just not engaging, not really that exciting. And, and I did not like coding and, and, and that side of, of computing. Um, and so it felt like at that time, there were these three areas. There was the mathematics, there was the computing, and then there was the visualization. And in my education, visualization was greatly de-emphasized. It was mostly the math, uh, followed by the computing. And that was true even when I was teaching intro stack courses. Um, granted, they weren't complicated uh, topics, but we still relied on formulas, going back to the table to get the p-values and all of that. And it wasn't driven by very engaging, interactive visualizations. But the time has arrived, right? We are now here because we now have interactive point and click statistical software like Jump that can do these interactive visualizations, but also do sophisticated statistics. And because that is sort of in a much easier environment, we can actually give students harder problems than I think we traditionally would have because the visualization helps connect maybe what might be a complicated statistical technique or what we would think was, but the visualization I think really helps them explore data and not have to do things that are too complicated, but still tackle um, uh, complicated problems. So the way I, I, I teach now, I teach a, a data science program at, at uh, Cal State Fullerton is I think, well, what are students gonna see when they get out there, okay? They're not gonna just see one sample, two sample problems. They're gonna get complex data, right? Many variables, lots of observations, you know, a lot of incomplete missing data. That's just what they're gonna see. And you can't stop that from happening. They're gonna get out there and get a job. And maybe they are a marketing analyst, at some company, and they're not gonna get simple problems. They're not just gonna get a two sample t-test. And the instructions they get 
or the objectives of the analysis, they're not very specific. No one comes up to, to that marketing analyst and says, can you do a two sample T test to tell me if there's a statistically significant difference between marketing strategy A and B? That's not how they phrase the question. They're, they're very open-ended like, hey, mine the data. Is there any features in the data or what can we learn from the data? And, and how are we doing? You know, Where are some opportunities we can take advantage of? That's the instruction. So it doesn't fit that framework from that traditional classroom. And the other part is the volume of analyses are huge. They may get data sets with hundreds of variables and they have to do hundreds of analyses, not just kind of one off. And so the way I've shifted my teaching is instead of thinking, okay, I'm gonna teach them only the tools that I know they can understand, right? The formulas aren't too complicated. I'm like, well, they can only understand the normal distribution or the t-test. I gotta keep it really simple. And then just hope they go out there and, and find those problems that those tools fit. I've shifted it. And the way I think of it now is I start off with the data sets. These are the kinds of data sets that students are going to see. These are the hard, complicated problems that are gonna be placed you know, on their desk. And can I, as an educator, give them not just a collection of tools, but a collection of skills, like a way to think and a way to tackle the data so that they can extract insights, even from something that traditionally we would never cover in a, in a one or two semester stack class, because we're like, wow, that's too, that's too complicated. But I don't want them to come across that and not be prepared. I want to prepare them. Okay. So I'm going to go, and this never gets old saying this, I'm going to jump over to jump. Okay. So this data set that I have open um, happens to be from a biologist that was uh, collecting data on the volume of a particular insect that is in all these different regions. It happens to be in, um, in Alberta, Canada. And so um, I've got more variables that are here, but I'm just, just showing you these. So you see, I've got this variable location. I have whether it's in the north or south region. I've got all these years. You can see the data starts um, in 1970. And then density is the, the amount of, of this insect. So the higher the number, the, the, the more that's there. Now, just to get a sense of what the data looks like, um, I am just going to summarize it graphically and just put the variables in here. Um, now you'll notice jump keeps track of what variable type it is, if it's continuous, if it's ordinal or nominal. And so jump's going to know what to do because it obviously knows what those variables are. So I'm going to hit OK. And basically, if it's a categorical variable like location, it's going to make a bar chart, show me a frequency table. So you see a bunch of those are that, like region and year. Um, and then when I get to the end, density is a continuous variable. So it's going to make a histogram, a box plot, show me some summary statistics, that kind of thing. OK, I'm just doing this because I want to get a sense of the data. And one of the things you might notice is, yes, there are 74 different locations. But you'll see that there is a lot of them that don't have many years that the data was collected. You can see if you look at the table, there's some locations that only have two years, three years, five years, and so on. And so what I'm going to do is just a quick little thing here is I'm going to just sort this column by that count. And the reason why I'm doing this is just so I can have this table um, ordered according to the, the locations that have the most years data collected. Now, why might I do that? Well, what's nice is you might say, well, you know what? I don't want to include in my analysis these locations that only have a few years. So maybe I'm going to do something like this where I'm going to pick uh, let's see, I'm going to do, how about, it has at least 20 years. Now, you notice when I clicked on that, all the data gets highlighted. It gets highlighted actually across every single graph, even down here in the density. And it also gets highlighted in the data table. Now, why is that useful? Well, because now I can just come over here and say subset the data. And now I have a data set here that is only those locations that have at least 20 years um, worth of data, right? Don't make students write code in order to subset data. That's that's mean. You you want you want point and click so they can they can subset the data. Okay, so I just did that. I'm going to close these because I have the file already here saved. So, oops. Okay. I just saved it here because I had some graphs um, saved specifically to it. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of 
um, what I mean by location is, th this is this area, this is in Alberta, Canada. And so I can drag in latitude and longitude into Jump's graph builder, and it's just gonna put a dot where every single one of those um, locations are. And I'm gonna come back to that um, in, in a moment, but I'm gonna start off with, okay, what do we want students to do here? We want them to graph data, right? We want them to just, just start exploring it. And so the graph builder is very simple in Jump. You just start dragging variables into different roles. So I'm gonna put the year down here. I'm gonna put density up here. Now I have every one of those locations. So that's, they're kind of all being rep represented there. Um, and up here is my palette. So I can, I can just add um, a connect line. Now, what I'm gonna do is I can actually even do some, some data filtering here if I want. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put location and region. And over here on the left, this left of my, of my graph palette window, is this data filter. And what this allows me to do is I can just subset the data, filter it by any one of these, in this case is location. So I can grab one of them, I can grab many of them. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna also throw it in the overlay there so I can see them individually. And so I can just click on any combination I wanna see. Now remember there's 48 locations here. That's a lot of locations, but let the students play. Let them click around and see what kind of features they see. And as I move through here, you'll actually start to notice some patterns, okay? Here, here's, a, here's a good example, this location. Do you see how, how around, starting around like the, 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 the year 2000 to, to about 2003, the data pops up a lot. And it's not, it's not true in every single location, but as I move around here, you'll notice there's many times where that particular time period, you'll see the data jump up. Now, do you need students to do a statistical test to determine if that's a significant jump in the, in the population of this insect? Or just, they can see that, right? They can explore that. You don't have to teach them time series analysis and how to do hypotheses testing uh, inside of there just, uh, just to do that, right? You can let them play and explore the data. And because I have so many combinations, I don't have to create a different graph every every sort of combination of data I wanna look at. The graph updates, you know, maybe I wanna look at, um, I'm gonna clear this here, maybe I only wanna look at the data uh, for the locations that are in the North region, or maybe I only wanna look at the data that's in the South region. And you can see how I can just click and bounce around and update that one graph, let them explore the data. And the way I actually do assignments now is I ask the students, I say, you know what, tell me three to five interesting features you saw in the data. And it's never failed. Students can always find three to five features they see in the data. And they're almost always correct. They're the things that have the most action. Um, I know there's times when you have to do a statistical test because the, the difference is so subtle, you can't see it. But there are times when it's so obvious. And, and by exploring data graphically, um, you can do this. Um, I'm gonna pull up a couple of graphs I've made. Now, instead of keep on going back to the graph builder and dragging in those variables, I'm just gonna open up the ones I've already saved just to, um, just to, just to save time. Um, so in fact, I'm gonna go back to that map one I showed you here. I can even come over here and I can float the cursor over every one of those locations and I can have the time series graph under each one of those data points. In fact, I can even grab it and I can kind of pin it to this graph. So here I can pop up a time series graph. I can go in and edit that text. That's just kind of the default text of all the information in there, but I can go in there and edit it. So now students can play around with this and try to find that pattern I'm, I was kind of pointing out. You can see that, right? In those particular years, as many of these locations, the, the data jumps up um, quite a bit. Okay, it's another graph that could be fun here. Um, I'm gonna do a time series graph, but instead of it being a static time series graph, I'm gonna have this be a time series graph that is in motion. Now, right now I only have one location, but as you can see, I can, I can add as many as I want here. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them all in there. So I wanna, this is where you're gonna notice if we come 90, 2000, 2002, three, see how they all jumped up right around 2002, 2003. You could see that, students can see that. They don't need to learn time series analysis and significance testing to do that. And so 
th this, and I can speed this up and slow it down. And there's all sorts of features I can do to this. Um, in fact, I could, you know, I can take these labels and pull them out. So if I always want to see that, um, that label, a particular location displayed, I can see that. Okay. And I also have the, I also have it so the north um, regions locations are all in red and the south locations are, are all in blue. So I just added that. Again, just drag and drop, point and click. Um, but just to save time, I'm just opening up what I already say. But it was just as easy as that first one I just showed you. You just drag the variables um, into, the, into the different roles. So that's one thing that the students might think of doing. And maybe that's, that's engaging. I think that's a lot more engaging to watch the time series kind of unfold and play out. Um, what was another one I did here? Oh, here. So this is, this is just that same graph. I just dragged in the latitude and longitude into the graph builder, put the map on it. But instead of there just being a dot for every location, I have the bubble size in here. So now when I hit play, let me speed this up a little bit, a little too slow. So now when I hit play, let's go a little faster here. So now when I hit play, the size of the bubble represents the population or the density of this, this particular insect. Now we'll count up to 2002, three, there it is, boom, right? You all saw that, right? Students can see that. I can slide this back and forth, right? There is the 2002, 2003. So this is another way to think of time series, but now I'm bringing in geographical location and watching it dynamically change. That's fun. That's engaging for students. Not, you know, they're not looking at code on a, on a screen trying to make this graph. They're pointing and clicking and playing. Um, just like the, that reason that I wanted a graduate degree in statistics is because I saw all those cool looking graphs and I wanted to make them. Um, didn't really want to learn calculus, but I did, I did end up falling in love with calculus and linear algebra, but it wasn't my initial, initial intent. And then the last graph I'll show you with this uh, data set, I have the size of the bubble is the, uh, the, the amount of this insect in those regions, just like I showed you, but then I dragged in this other variable where I changed the color. And so the way I have this set up is if the color is green, and the, and, and the darker the green, then it's a larger percent increase in the population from the year before. And the more red it is, then it's a decrease. And so again, I just drag those variables into the graph builder. And if I come up to, I'm going to keep on moving to that 2002, 2003, get up there, 99, 2000. You see on the, on the left, I'm moving over. Went a little too far. Let me back up here. So 2001, 2002, 2003. See, not only do the points get bigger, but they, you know, they're going to get green because I, I've changed it to be that. And when I go to 2004, now that's when I'm seeing the big drop in the population. So this is another fun way to see that dynamic change in those years that are, that are happening. Much more fun to play with it like that. OK, I'm going to open up another data set, try to have to try to have just as much fun with it. Oops. Okay. I, I, I don't know if we're tired of doing this or not, but we're going to look at some COVID data. Okay. So this is a, a collection of COVID data measuring all sorts of um, variables like the number of cases, the number of new cases, uh, the number of, of deaths, the testing rate, the hospital rates, just a whole bunch of variables you see I have over here, right? There's 37 different variables. Again, this is the kind of data students are going to see. You can't just limit them to one sample, two sample, and little simple one way. No, they're going to see more complicated things. Give them these big data sets. Let them wrestle with it. It's a lot more fun. Now, I can go in here and jump, and I can create this thing called the data filter. And what this allows me to do is I can pick, and I'm just going to pick a couple just so you can um, get the idea here. I'm going to pick. Uh, location, that's, that's going to be country, continent, and population. And now what I can do is I can subset this data according to a specific, say, continent or sp specific countries, or maybe even population size. I might say, you know, I only want to look at data that work on countries that have at least 100 million um, uh, people or something like that. Or I only want to look at South America, or I want to look at North America, or Europe, or Asia. And I just, I just click on those in the data. Um, gets filtered. And so I'm just going to open up a subset of that data that I already made. And I just have this down to 25 countries that I selected 
Um, and these are just was, were just countries that I that you know they had a, a large population size. They were also um, they were also ones that there was a lot of attention. You know, Italy, you know, um, China, the United States, you know, um, the UK. So I just filtered it. So there's only 25 countries in in um, in this uh, data set, and I I filtered it down. Um, okay, so just like we did before. Again, I'm not showing you how to make it, just drag the variables in. I just want to make it, make it quick. So I just drag them all in and just save this, save this uh, graph. Now, this is just a time series graph, right? Of these 25 countries. And over on the left, I just have every one of these variables. I brought them all in. Let the students just click through. Now you might be seeing weird patterns like, well, what's that? Well, this is where you can help the students understand why it's important to smooth out data. Maybe they learned that from, um, you know, from I think there was so much COVID data on the news all the time that you start to understand why you have to smooth data because of how data is reported, right? So it has this. Let them click this around. Okay, you can see countries that stand out from other countries, right? They're they're right on the screen. You don't have to teach them time series and significance tests. They can see a lot of those features. And if you ask them, hey, you know, find a half a dozen or so features in the data. Tell me about them. They'll find them. Now, along the same lines of what I did with that, with that insect data, I also set this up so I can put this in a little motion plot. Let me speed this up here so it moves a little quicker, right? And I can see that move. So I've got, um, I've got the uh, deaths per million cases on the y-axis until, oh, look at that, you know, we're winning. We're doing so great. Look at that, we're leading. Um, I can also swap out a variable if I want. So, now I'm going to put total cases per million on the x-axis. And I got deaths per million on the, on the y-axis. Again, let students play with this. They can grab this, drag this back and forth, watch with these countries where it goes up and down, the ones that look grouped together, the ones that stand out. Okay, It's easy to create these graphs because they're just dragging in variables. Okay? I'm, just, I'm just pulling up a couple different ones so you can kind of just, just see. And again, I'm going to drag this around. This I thought was an interesting one. This is total cases per million on the y-axis and the total test per thousand on the x-axis. Now, a student would drag this around, and what what are the what's something that just popped out to you? Look at Denmark compared to all the other countries. I'm going to get 25 countries in here. Look at that. It's doing the most tests per capita but has a very low total cases relative to that, right? And you can see the countries that are grouping together and how they're, how they're changing and maybe they're bending upward or when they start leveling off, right? You can start seeing right there where it's leveling off. I tell you, students get engaged with this kind of thing. They find this fun, okay? That's how they explore data. And I don't need to see a p-value. I don't need to see a confidence interval. Just tell me the insights you're, you're seeing. Tell me what you're learning from playing around with the data. Um, here was another one I thought was kind of interesting. This was um, new cases is on the um, new cases is on the y-axis and pos the the positivity rate of these. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to uh, I'm going to put test uh, test over there. Same thing. I can drag this around. Okay. So this is not total, this is the new cases. Now, this data is bouncing all over the place, but you're telling me a student can't see how that the US is way over there on the right and where the other countries are grouping together. You can see um, over here, this is um, the Netherlands over on the, the far, let me drag this over, you can see, right? Switzerland and the Netherlands are up there. See where France is, you can see where the UK is and Italy, right? Italy and France are similar. You can see where the US is bouncing over there, okay? Now, I tackled what would traditionally be challenging problems, right? Many variables. In fact, if you look at this data set, it's got missing observations. It even has some, some um, erroneous data points in there that the graphs kind of pick out because some countries don't start taking measurements until later. But in a traditional stat class with one sample, two sample inference, maybe simple linear regression, maybe some you know one-way ANOVA, we wouldn't give them this problem. It's too hard. It's too complicated. But if we're just interacting with graphs now, if we're playing with data, then we can do that. We can let them have fun with it. And, and they're better prepared for the jobs. They're better prepared for the data that they're gonna see when they get out and work. 
Um, and, and I just as I said, I've shifted the way I, I teach, even though I love visualization and I thought I was leaning that way, I still in the past felt like I was bringing in a little too much math. And now when I teach, I just rely so much on tools like this um, as a way to have the students get insights and know how to analyze data. It's not necessarily the tools. I want to teach them the skills and sort of the, the, the concept of critical thinking and how one looks at data. Um, I haven't been looking at the chat, so I, um, I don't know if questions have been coming up and if Kurt and Ross um, has been able to address, but we do have a few minutes, um, so maybe um, we, can, we can do that if we want. Um, okay, at the moment, I don't see any questions okay, posted. Oh, here we go, here's our first one. I'm gonna encourage everybody, I'm gonna put 22 year old me back up on the screen. I'm gonna encourage everybody to ask questions. You can either ask 22 year old me or 51 year old me, you can pick. So here, uh, we actually got a question pretty quickly. Uh, can you share a bit about reproducibility uh, using logs, for example? Oh, you mean um, the, the jump log file? Is that, or, oh, or log? I would, uh, yes, yes. Okay, so every time you do an analysis in jump, a couple things going on. Now, I'm just gonna click on one of these scripts I have saved. Every time you do an analysis, as I was clicking and dragging variables into different roles, a bunch of code gets written, okay? Now, 99% of the time you can use jump without ever interacting with the code. But the reason why the code is nice is it actually opens up a lot of flexibility because I can get into this scripting language and do things like, I can connect to R, I can connect to MATLAB, I can connect to Python, I can start customizing analyses, customizing menus. So that's one place where the scripts are. Now, there is a log file that also gets created. So everything I've done is saved in this log file. Okay, so everything I've been doing, I, I think this goes back maybe a couple of days because I haven't, yeah, it goes back for two days. So any of these that I click on, right on the bottom, you'll see, now let me move this up just you can see it a little bit more there is my scripts for those analyses so they are saved um, and that allows me to launch them again um, modify them if i want customize if i want uh, but typically the way you're using jump most of the time is you and i'll just do something really really simple i'll just just make up two little histograms here is when you run an analysis, and I've got this output window here, and this is an interactive window. I can play with this. I can filter data from here. I can color points. Right from here, I can save that script to the data table. I give it a name. I hit OK. And I don't know if you saw that, but right here on the left, that one just got added. So that's more often how people save their work is they save these to the data table. But it's not just the output. That's the key. It's not just the static piece of output the script gets saved to the data table. So, so in this case of COVID, let's say it's a month from now and this data table gets updated with the next month's worth of data. I don't have to rerun that again because by launching this script, it's going to use the most recent data. And so it's not static output, you're saving actually scripts that are connected to the data table and update as you update the data. Okay, we have another question coming in. Um, just got the first part though. So. Okay. Now I wanna encourage you um, after this, come over to, uh, to our booth. We got a little booth set up. There's gonna be a couple of us there and then we can really dive into these, these questions in some detail. We can show you things. We can talk about licensing. We can check to see if your school already has a license. Um, I'll answer some questions now, but really encourage you to come over to our booth because then we can really dive into some specific things um, that you wanna see. Uh, but go ahead, Megan, with that question, if, if you got it now. Okay. Yes, I have it now. So is the COVID data a publicly available data set? Yes, this is. Um, and I can send you, um, um, come over to the booth and I'll show you this, this link. In fact, this is a, a website I found, this uh, nonprofit organization that just has a massive amount of world data. Um, and COVID is just one of the data sets. And it, it's really thorough that they're referencing um, you know, this is from this variables from the John Hopkins. Um, this is from this source. This is from this source. This is from um, the United Nations data repository on this. And, and, and I'll, if you come over to the booth, I'll, I'll show it to you. It's a really great uh, source of data for your class. 
All right, I think that uh, finishes up the questions that are in the chat. Um, but as Kevin says, if you have any questions for Jump, please stop by the booth in Gathertown to um, find out more about this data set, about licensing, or any other questions you might have about Jump. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, you might see me walking around. I'm the vampire avatar. So if you see me, please stop and chat with me. <laughs> All right. Thank Sounds you so wonderful. Much, Megan, for coordinating this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye now, everybody. Thank you. Bye.